My name is Rita Molesky, and I'm an Associate Professor of Surgery at Yale University. This session, sponsored by the STS Workforce on Critical Care, will highlight the perioperative care of aortic emergencies, specifically ascending aortic aneurysms, and their catastrophic emergent complication of dissections. Ascending aortopathies can involve the root, the ascending aorta, or both in a fusiform pathology. The primary risk of ascending aortopathies is an aortic dissection or intramural hematoma. There are two nomenclature systems for dissections. Dissections that include the proximal aorta are classified as Stanford type A or DeBakey 1 and 2, and dissections that include the distal descending only are classified as Stanford B or type 3 uh, DeBakey dissections. A type A dissection is a catastrophic presentation, as you can see here in this video, and requires immediate diagnosis and treatment. When considering the fundamentals of perioperative care of ascending aneurysms and dissections, it's important to consider three key critical concepts. Number one, hemodynamic support for patients with pre-rupture and cardiac tamponade leading to hemodynamic collapse, as well as cardiac dysfunction, leading to global ischemia. Number two, neurologic preservation of the brain and spinal cord. And number three, malperfusion. Both early recognition and treatment are essential. And these three critical concepts will be highlighted throughout this session in the preoperative, operative, and postoperative care of aortopathies and dissection in patients. The major fatal complications to be vigilant for and immediately identify in aortopathies and dissections involving the proximal aorta include rupture and tamponade, congestive heart failure from AI, myocardial ischemia, stroke, and malperfusion. The major fatal complications to identify for dissections involving the distal aorta include rupture and hemothorax, renal, GI, lower extremity, and spinal cord malperfusion. The common pathophysiology is malperfusion of end organs, which may include global malperfusion due to rupture or tamponade, cardiac malperfusion due to shearing of the coronaries, brain malperfusion leading to stroke, spinal cord malperfusion leading to paraplegia, abdominal and renal malperfusion, and peripheral vascular leading to limb ischemia. In the preoperative period in the ICU, there are multiple critical considerations for diagnosis and treatment of patients with ascending aneurysms and dissections as the patient is waiting for operative repair. Most of these diagnostics, which will begin preoperatively, should be continued postoperatively and are critical to prevent catastrophic complications and end organ damage and include the identification of acute AI and congestive heart failure either with TTE or TEE and medical management until the patient can be emergently repaired in the operating room. The identification of coronary malperfusion utilizing an EKG or CT angio. The identification of cerebral malperfusion. And it's important to perform both a baseline and then serial neurologic exams and obtain a CTA of the head and neck or carotid dopplers if possible if there's a neurologic dysfunction or a change in neurologic exam, both preoperatively and postoperatively. The identification of abdominal or renal malperfusion by performing serial abdominal exams and check serial lactate, creatinine, and liver function tests, again, both preoperatively and postoperatively. The identification of peripheral malperfusion and serial exams should be performed to assess perfusion and bedside dopplers, lactate, and CK obtained to identify the need for potential fasciotomy and avoid rhabdomyolysis in both preoperatively and postoperatively. And of course, patients with pre-rupture or contained rupture with tamponade should obviously go directly to the operating room. It's critical to know that the first therapeutic strategy to utilize for both ascending aneurysms and dissection is immediate management of pain and blood pressure. It's important to titrate the blood pressure and to monitor the patient's neurologic function to prevent stroke 
or paraplegia by decreasing the blood pressure too low or too fast. The most important pathophysiologic mechanism to address is a decrease in the force of contraction. Beta blockers are primarily utilized if tolerated to reduce the force of contraction on the aortic wall or the DPDT, which can lead to continued weakening of the arterial wall. If a beta blocker cannot be utilized, nicardipine and esmolol can be used as alternatives. And utilizing this algorithmic approach, blood pressure can be appropriately titrated utilizing neurologic and hemodynamic parameters. Now, postoperatively, as the patient comes out of the operating room, the most important information to receive in handoff from the OR to the ICU, again, involves the three key physiologic systems. Neurologic function, the arch reconstruction times are critical to outcome, and this is important information to obtain in the handoff. Results of neurologic monitoring in the OR are also important to know in handoff. And it's critical to know if the patient had paraplegia preoperatively, if the patient has an ICP drain in place, and to monitor the patient for delayed paraplegia, which may require modifications of blood pressure goals and placement of an ICP drain in the ICU. From a hemodynamic standpoint, it's important to keep the blood pressure parameters in concordance with the procedure performed and the surgeon's blood pressure goals. Dissection can have a static or a dynamic dissection flap and can cause malperfusion in either one or more uh, physiologic organ systems. Perioperatively, there must be a high degree of suspicion because mortality is higher the greater the number of organ systems and malperfusion. And at handoff, it's important to know if there was malperfusion going into the operating room and whether it was addressed intraoperatively or not. So again, the top three postoperative goals and information that must be obtained from handoff of the patient from the OR to the ICU are brain and spinal cord ischemia, hemodynamics, and malperfusion and end organ. The post-operative therapeutic approach for ascending aneurysms or proximal dissection repair is focused again on three intimately interrelated major physiologic systems and can be approached in the algorithmic manner post-operatively. Post-operative hemodynamics can be divided into uh, cardiogenic function and blood pressure control. For cardiogenic function, it's important to assess EKG, especially if the patient had a root procedure with coronary reimplantation. It's important to obtain the results of the intraoperative TEE and, if it's necessary, perform a bedside TTE to assess cardiac function or change in function and continue to titrate inotropic support to maintain adequate cardiac perfusion. For blood pressure control, it's essential in these aortic cases that an appropriate balance be kept between the quality of the aortic tissue and bleeding and adequate perfusion to maintain neurologic and end organ function. Information should be obtained from the surgeon on the blood pressure range, which is appropriate for each patient. Consideration should be given for volume resuscitation, especially if the patient is bleeding. The patient may arrive from the operating room hypothermic due to circulatory arrest and therefore should be warmed to normal thermia. If the patient has a coagulopathy, appropriate coagulation labs should be obtained and the appropriate coagulation factors replaced. Again, in concordance with the surgeon and the patient's operative and intraoperative course, the blood pressure stabilization can be maintained either with a vasodilator or vasopressors. Postoperative neurologic function can be divided into cerebral and spinal cord function. Ascending aortopathy and dissection repair can impact postoperative neurologic function, and specifically the arch reconstruction time with either RCP or ACP. So frequent neurovascular checks are critical and must be performed in these patients to identify any postoperative neurologic dysfunction, either cerebral or spinal cord. If neurologic dysfunction or deficit is noted, it should be immediately investigated by imaging for cerebral dysfunction to identify the etiology.
For spinal cord ischemia, elevation of blood pressure utilizing a presser and consideration of an ICP drain for spinal cord ischemia and paraplegia are warranted. Postoperative malperfusion is interrelated with hemodynamic and, neuro and the neurologic physiologic systems, and these have been discussed. For peripheral vascular malperfusion, as with preoperative assessment, postoperatively, there must be frequent neurovascular checks, Dopplers, lactate, and CK to assess for potential fasciotomy and uh, to prevent rhabdomyolysis. Abdominal and renal ischemia must also be monitored with serial lactate, creatinine, and liver function tests to assess abdominal organ function. For the patient uh, with a type, uh, a distal aorta or type B dissection, they can be treated medically or by the utilization of TVAR repair, depending on the patient's pathophysiology. The initial management is medical management. Again, in the distal dissection, as in proximal, it's critical to know that the first therapeutic strategy is immediate management of pain and blood pressure control. It's important, again, to titrate the pressure to the patient's neurologic function to prevent stroke or paraplegia by lowering the pressure too low or too fast. And utilizing, again, this algorithmic approach, blood pressure can be appropriately titrated using neurologic and hemodynamic parameters. So for patients with uncomplicated type B dissection, the long-term therapy is most often medical management. There are a subset of uncomplicated type B dissection patients for which TVAR is the initial management. For patients with a complicated type B dissection, TVAR is the therapeutic approach, and these patients must be monitored for the sequelae of malperfusion, such as acute renal failure, gut ischemia, peripheral vascular ischemia, and spinal cord ischemia and paraplegia. Postoperatively, in the acute phase, immediate increase in the patient's MAP and placement of an ICP drain should be considered for patients with the onset of paraplegia in the ICU. Postoperative care of the spinal drain will be covered by Dr. Chatterjee in the second session on acute aortic emergencies. And for hemothorax or leak, the best therapeutic option is TVAR. Priorities and major morbidities to avoid for the neurologic system Patients require frequent neuro checks and assessment. And for cerebral function, any uh, neurologic dysfunction must be immediately evaluated and treated. For spinal cord ischemia, blood pressure optimization and possible ICP drain should be warranted. For hemodynamic stabilization, patients must be assessed for coronary malperfusion and myocardial dysfunction. Hemodynamic stabilization can be accomplished with volume resuscitation and pharmacologic support, and blood pressure can be managed utilizing an algorithmic approach. For malperfusion, both end organ and peripheral vascular, these must be monitored and immediately treated. Thus, uh, utilizing the approach discussed in this session, the perioperative priorities of brain and spinal cord perfusion, hemodynamic stabilization, and minimization of end organ malperfusion can be accomplished in the perioperative period in the ICU for aortopathies and dissection. Thank you.